Um, so we're going to, um, I will record this for anybody who wants to see it. We're going to use a PowerPoint to review. Um, for your exam, it'll be the same as usual, multiple choice, um, two points a question. You'll have five math questions. So that'll be a total of 10 points on the exam. So just make sure you're reviewing. Um, on my, for my class, I put in announcements, um, the math reviews, and I want you guys to really take a look at those and um, review your problems because that's an easy 10 points for you. So if you can get those. Um, any questions before we start? Your study guide is gonna be your priority to focus on. Um, I know that the material was covered quickly because it was covered over really a week and 10 minutes or so. So it was covered quickly um, and it really all kind of blends together. I'm gonna try to help guide you, but like I advised my class, this class is going to be a lot about um, a lot about applying the things that we learn in here to our med uh, to our med surge background. So the questions are going to be med surge based in the sense they'll give you a scenario, say um, a child, uh, um, you know, what are we looking for in school nursing with children? And one of the Healthy People 2020 objectives that we went over in class was for to promote um, kids to come to school who have asthma. So something like that. So understand that it's not just going to be, I'm going to memorize this, but do know that our study guide aligns with the exam. So are there any questions? Because I know the material is pretty um, intense. And so I want to um, just make sure. If you guys could just in the chat, if you would put your uh, name, that's all I need. I'll take attendance that way. Any questions before we start? Okay, so I'll pull up the PowerPoint. We're going to share this. Um, we'll take a look at this. And what this is, is I made it myself and it, it corresponds to the, um, to the study guide almost exactly. So let's take a look. All right, so our first thing that we're going to take a look at is going to be, oops, here we go, is going to be family. And like, what we want to think about with family is, is that there's no uh, right model of the family. We talked about characteristics of healthy versus unhealthy. Does anybody remember what that was? Um, spending time together. Like if a family's not around each other at all, that's a, not a good sign of a healthy family. Good. There is a box in our book. Does every does anybody remember the box I showed my class anyway? And it d gives you description. So like if on a test, what kind of question do you think might be a multiple choice on characteristics of healthy versus unhealthy? Anybody, if you think about it, so multiple choice might be something like the following are characteristics of a unhealthy of a healthy family. A, they play games together. B, they um, they all go in separate rooms to talk on their cell phone. C, they order out for dinner and don't sit together. D, um, they don't participate in birthdays, okay? So what do you think our choice would be there for a functional or healthy versus unhealthy? It's really low. I think Bradolin, I think you're talking, but you're not muted, but I can't hear anything you're saying. He said there's some people in the waiting room trying oh, to get okay. in. Okay, thanks. Oh, because when I, all right, let me stop sharing for a second. All right, let me. Okay, thank you. Because I closed it up. Um, there we go. Okay, so welcome to everybody who's just joining who was in the waiting room. There was a little error with the um, with the personal ID number, putting it on. So one of my students let me know that. Thank you, I appreciate that. So we just started really, we were talking about healthy versus uh, unhealthy families. I'm sharing a PowerPoint. This goes along with our study guide. So I'm gonna go back to sharing. We we're just talking about how we could have a multiple choice question over what's healthy versus unhealthy. And as one of our students suggested that healthy is spending time together, um, not being separate, uh, not being apart. That's how our book, we have a nice box on um, in chapter 18 that will give you our characteristics of healthy versus unhealthy. Any questions on that one? All right, how does nursing prioritize interventions? So when we're doing interventions, um, 
what kind of things do we look at? When, what are we going to, what is going to be most important to us as a nurse when we're looking at, say we're assessing a family, what kind of circumstances are we going to be looking at to be our priorities? Safety. Good safety. I want you to think a little med surgery on this one. What kind of things are going to make us really want to um, access that patient quickly and take care of them? ABCs. Very good. Excellent. I think that was Lisa. Awesome. You're going to think ABCs on a question like nursing interventions. So what's going to be our priority is our airway, our breathing, and our circulation, right? So if I were to give you certain scenarios and say which is the most, what should the nurse prioritize looking at when looking at a family or children, we're going to do the one where um, it addresses airway, breathing, and circulation. Things like a rash, nice to know, nice to look at, something to worry about, um, but not something we're going to prioritize on, okay? Excuse me. So think ABCs on that one. That's delegation and prior prioritization. So that's really what I, I'm talking about there. Any questions on that one? I have a question. So that question came up and they said they had asthma. That would be part of the ABCs? Well, it wouldn't be part of the ABCs unless they had um, a compromise with it. So if they said you have an asthmatic who's due for his um, pre-exercise inhaler, or you have a child who is having difficulty breathing. Does that make sense? Whoever asked. Kind of. It's going to be very specific to, if you don't address it, then they could go into further compromise. So okay. you're not going to do a standardized pre-exercise is not going to be a priority to a kid that's not breathing. Okay. Right? Okay. It's kind of like if someone has chest pain and somebody has a broken foot, what's our priority? Does that make sense? Yes, please. Like broken foot. Yeah, it's important. We'll handle it. We'll take care of it. Um, but not a priority if we're in the ER. Right? Is that a little clearer? So asthma is one that we would look at. But if they're not compromised with asthma, then we wouldn't. But if they're wheezing or they're having difficulty breathing, that's going to be a priority. But if we're doing pre-exercise treatment, that's not going to be a priority to a kid that's struggling. Good? Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to go to our next one. So that's where you see family. And I said to those that were in the waiting room that did not um, join, that joined a little later, what I said in this exam is it's going to be a lot of using your med surge. I just want to make sure nobody else is waiting. Okay. It's using our med surge. Um, our med surge knowledge and applying it to community principles like nursing priorities in the family, nursing priorities in the school. Okay, so I need you guys to have that mindset of, and I told my class, this class is really about teaching concepts so we pull everything together. Okay, so you don't say, well, where are, why is it med surge with community? Because community nursing, you're gonna need all of that. You're gonna need peds, you're gonna need OB, you're gonna need all of it when you're a community nurse. Okay. So, all right. So here we look at our importance of age-related concern. So infants, I want you to focus on um, SIDS for them. So what, do, what are things we look at? Sleeping on a soft surface, if they smoke during pregnancy, if they get too hot, uh, young maternal age, pre-termers are more likely to have it, and males actually are as well. And then, then children, we know we're going to be looking at um, what kind of things, when we're looking at a playground, what kind of things are going to be dangerous on a playground for a kid? Does anybody know? What are, what are some things we would look at on a playground? Um, the equipment, the materials, what kind of material it is, um, the setting and uh, equipment management. Okay, so be a little more specific. Specific, you were right, but be a little more specific so that we know what you mean. Like, is there like multiple occupancy screens or like single occupancy screens? If there is a barrier that protects the ground or uh, good yeah how about hooks yeah how like hooks, hooks swings ropes yeah 
those are the kind of things we're looking at when we're looking at a playground. Do you see where I'm saying this is sort of like um, more, it's in your reading in your book in this chapter about um, age related concerns, which I believe is chapter 19 or 20. But it's, it's things that we think about that we can sort of use a little bit of common sense with and then know our community background as well. All right, gun violence and safety. I hope you guys would know what are going to be primary prevention principles. Education. What are we going to educate on? How to store storage. Them. Yeah, how to store them. What else? Putting the ammunition separate from the gun. Okay, good. Um, we're going to make sure it's locked up. Um, and these are all things we're going to be teaching our families, right, about gun safety. And then tertiary prevention. When a child has a chronic condition, now if they have a chronic condition, what type of prevention are we already on? Tertiary, tertiary treatment. Yes, treatment, because they already have the condition. Good. So what are we going to, what do we know about chronic illness? What do they need to do a lot of? Rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Okay, before rehab, what, what do they have a lot of? Treatments. I think somebody said that again. Treatment and management. Uh, somebody, I think, just said it. I think it was Lisa. Lisa, what did you say? Education. Mm. All right, education. Who's educating them? The nurse. Mm, okay, but remember, education, we're, we're looking at tertiary. So it's something about their treatment. It's treatment and management. Mm -hmm. So in order to get treatment, where do they have to go? Doctor. Uh, appointment. Yes, appointments. Very good. So they're going to have tons of appointments. What do you think parents of children with chronic illness have oftentimes do with all these appointments? Miss them. Forget. Yep, forget, miss them, whatever. So what we're going to make sure on these kids with chronic illness is, is that we're making sure that they have their appointments scheduled, they're, attend, they're going to them, those kind of things, right? Because remember, we're doing tertiary prevention, which is going to try to minimize the impacts of the disease, really. Any questions on that one? No. Okay. All right. So here I gave you some pictures because I really like to show pictures to help everybody remember. So here's the baby. So we remember about SIDS. Here's the gun. It's in a case. The playgrounds, we make sure we have gravel on the bottom so there's not concrete underneath. We take a look at um, the safety on it. And then what I have here is like a calendar, cell phone, and alarm. That's for our chronic illnesses. And we're going to make sure that we help them keep their appointments and that they know where to go and that they're attending them and things like that. Good on that one. All right. On adolescents, we're going to be looking for violence. It can be... Um, in relationships, we could also see weapons, drug use, motor vehicle. Um, they're going to start driving. So what are some of the things we're going to remember that we're going to be teaching as a primary prevention to those parents who have kids that are driving? Driving rules, safety. Yep, safety. What seat kind belt. of safety? Seat belts. Good. Seat yep, seat belts. How to make sure they know driving. the importance. What? Not texting when dry, driving. Yeah. yeah. What else? Not Maybe. playing loud music. Hmm? Not playing loud music. Yeah. And watching the number of kids in the car, right, when they're young. All right. So for adolescents, we're going to remember violence and we're, we're going to remember those um, safety things that we're teaching for new drivers. Okay. All right, there will be several questions on here on primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So I need everybody to know what they are. In my class, um, we went over this several times. And so you guys really need to know primary is going to be when you're preventing. So it's for like the healthy people. Okay, we're going to use it to reduce risk factors and prevent disease. Where do we see this? We see it in healthy people. Okay. Then our secondary is screening. So we're gonna see this with, when we have screenings for early diagnosis so that we can treat it, so that we can shorten our duration. 
and severity of the disease. And then tertiary is gonna be when we're already treating, remember we just talked about chronic illness, you're gonna be treating already at this point. And we're gonna to try to make it so that the people can be uh, lived to their highest level. And so we're gonna see activities such as rehab, and we're gonna see people who already have the disease, okay? So here, how does this come into play when doing planning for children diagnosed with a chronic condition? We already talked about that. When it comes to smoking and children diagnosed with chronic conditions, how would a community nurse do primary and tertiary prevention? What are we gonna do for primary? So primary prevention would be to try to get them to not start smoking in the first place. That'd be like patient education on risk factors associated with cigarettes. Secondary would be more like trying to screen for catching lung cancer. So doing like chest x-rays um, early on before anything is even symptomatic. And then tertiary would be say doing treatments for a patient with COPD because they've been smoking cigarettes a pack a day for 20 years. Good, think about a kid. Well, how are we gonna do tertiary prevention with a kid who's maybe exposed? Educate the parent on secondhand smoke. Okay, but we're looking more towards our tertiary. How would we, what are we gonna do for those kids maybe that have already been exposed to a parent with who smokes? They may need um, like asthma care yeah. and nebulizers, things like yep. that. Good, good. So I want you guys thinking about those things, how we can apply everything to um, what we already know. Okay. And now my next picture, it's really about, um, I do it three different ways. So I do it the our first way, and then we're going to look at schools. And where we're going to see in schools is we're going to be doing health promotion. We're going to be teaching them healthy diet. We're going to be teaching them exercise. We're going to be teaching the kids this, right? And then when we go for secondary, we're going to be screening for health problems. So anybody, oops, 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 so sorry. Anybody who's familiar with school nursing, you do vision and hearing screenings for your kids. And so what that's going to do is look for any health problems there. They used to do weight as well, but they don't do that anymore. Um, and then our tertiary prevention as school nurses is we care for our kids with chronic health problems. So we give the, the asthma kids their inhalers. We give the diabetics their insulin. We give the, um, you know, um, we give medication for ADHD. We give medication for ADD. We give medication for mood altering, things like that. Okay, so I want you to be able to apply it to school nursing. And then here for violence, I, uh, I just like this one because it sort of is something that maybe you guys can um, think about. So when we do primary with violence, we're gonna be doing like anti-violence campaigns to the general public. We're gonna be doing empowerment and for um, kids and for females and for males, encouraging them to be, you know, teaching them how to be stronger and how to stand up for things that are not right. Then when we do our secondary, we're gonna do screening programs. We're gonna say, and if anyone's gone to the GP, a lot of times they'll run through a thing. Do you have this? Have you been this? Have, okay. We're gonna look at risk factors such as alcohol use and, um, then the last one is gonna be our tertiary. And this is really where we're gonna treat the problems that have happened because of violence. And our goal here is to prevent the violence from taking their lives. So we're gonna do mental health treatment. We're gonna do support groups. I will tell you on tertiary, you're gonna see a lot of support groups, okay? For group, for people with chronic illness or some sort of condition. So um, there's some words that I like to use to help you guys on this. So primary, you're gonna see a lot of educating. Secondary, you're gonna be seeing the word screening a lot. And tertiary, you're gonna be seeing uh, support groups, rehabilitation, those kind of things. Those are just kind of key words to remember. This is a big concept and it is on every one of your exams. Are there any questions on this at all? Mm -mm. Okay, because this will be on your exams. A couple questions about this. <clears throat> All right, so then we move along and we're looking at public health right here. So what's our purpose? Our primary goal of public health is to prevent disease and disability. We have a population-focused practice. 
We work to understand the problems in a population focused practice. We're looking at the population. We're looking to see what problems do we have? What solutions do we have? And what affects each one of those, all right? We have health policies in public health that create standards. The goal of our public health policy is to decrease the mortality related to communicable diseases. Leading cause of mortality is shifted to chronic illness and the increase in the number of older adults and increasing population has created a challenge. So what's a question you guys think might come out of that? Maybe it's a lot of that applied. Okay, so give me something, anything. Maybe what the leading cause of mortality would be. Okay. Shifted to be. Sure, could be that. What else might you see there? What are some of the uh, leading causes of mortality select other lives? Okay, could be. We could see something along the lines of public health policies create health standards because A, we decrease the mortality related to communicable diseases. B, we see the increase in the number of older adults creating a challenge. And C, um, chronic illnesses have shifted the cause of mortality. That's not the question, but I'm just giving you some helps here. Or, you know, select all that apply. The primary goal of public health is A, population focus, B, the prevention of disease and disability, C, um, the increase in number of adults. So what would our choices be there? What's our best answer, primary goal of public health? Prevention of disease and disability. Right. Okay. And so here we talk again about the increase in older people. We know this, that the baby boomers are coming up. Um, so we remember that when we're thinking about our increasing population for public health. Population of the world do, is increasing due to increased fertility rates and decreased mortality. They're living longer due to advances in healthcare, including vaccination, screening tools, and medications. If I were you, I would know these different things. So if I were to say to you, uh, why is the population of the world increasing? Decreased mortality, increased fertility rates. Yep, what else? Advances in technology for healthcare. Keep going. Uh, increased lifespan and longevity. Nope, it's right in front of you on the PowerPoint. Vaccines and screening. Yep and medications. You see that? So population of the world is increasing due to all these things. Increased fertility, decreased mortality, advances in healthcare, vaccination, screening tools, and medication. Good? All righty. So I just gave you another picture here. This is just public health and all the things that play in public health. When we look at health, we're looking at lifestyle, family history, how they sleep, how they take care of themselves, diet, environment, exercise, stress, healthcare, relationship, all these intertwine. Okay, um, when we look at our patient rights, we're gonna make sure that we know that unless a patient is declared incompetent, patients should be able to have the right to self-determine when managing their finances. What group of people do we worry about abuse, financial abuse with? The elderly. Very, yep, very good. So when we see something where a patient says, oh, my, my son just took over my finances, is that gonna be something we need to follow up on? Yes. Uh, absolutely. It could be something that's a good choice for the family, but be very careful. Because unfortunately, as I said to my class, you know, you get to that age where you've lived your whole life and then people turn around and those that you've helped turn around and abuse you, which is a horrible thought. But that happens and it's there. So ethical issues related to abuse, we talked about that um, and screening. So we wanna make sure on our older people, we are maximizing their self-care cap cap capacity, managing chronic diseases, preventing complications, deteriorating, um, delaying deterioration, achieving the highest possible quality of care and um, 
giving them comfort, peace, and dignity? What kind of question do you think is going to come out of this? Select all that apply. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. The primary focus of community-based nursing, and these are our two topics we talked about in the first week. We have community-based and we have community-oriented. Our primary focus of community-based is on the care of sick. Okay, and our community oriented is going to be on the healthcare, um, more of the healthy. So, our healthcare of individuals and families. Everybody clear on that one? Those are kind of definitional. You know, just know those two definitions. All right, then we move along to role as a school nurse as a whole school community child. So when we look oh, at this- I'm, I'm sorry, I do have a question. So yep. community oriented is more based on prevention where uh, community base is based on treating and community oriented is more prevention for the community. It's more community oriented is more screening the community and seeing what it, what are some uh, things that might happen in there that we can work on. Once they're ill, then you have your community based. So sort of what you were saying, do you understand? So it's not that they're, you're trying to prevent things within a family with community oriented nursing and with community based, you're taking care of somebody who's already have something. Cool, thank you, thank you, sure. thank you. Yep. All right, then we look at our school nurse, right? And so we know that uh, school nurses, if you remember your school nurse, which I know almost everybody remembers a school nurse at some point, but anyway, so they work as, um, they do a whole thing. They're holistic in the sense they take care of the school, the community, and the child. So when we look at this picture here, I just like it, and I used it in my class. So the nurses in the middle, we're looking at our healthy, safe, engaged, supportive challenge. These are things that we're going to be as the nurse. What are we going to do to help? Um, we're going to span out. We're going to look at community. What, what's in the community that can help um, our students? Family engagement, our employees that we work with, our physical environment, social emotional well being. So there's a lot of counseling and social services that happen um, with the school nurse. Think about kids who always have a stomach ache. Has anybody done school nursing? No. So I do this as a career right now. So that's, um, I want you to think about what do you think kids come to the nurse for the most? About what? A band-aid. <laughs> they come a lot for a band-aid, but they really come. Belly the, what? Like their, their belly is upset, like a tummy ache. Yep. And there's another one that goes with stomach aches. Headaches. Yep. Exactly. They come for those two things. I, I, I get about 20 kids a day. So what you come to find out is, I mean, could a child come to a school nurse and have appendicitis? Well, yes, but I doubt they'll be at school. So what you end up finding is you do a lot of counseling to the kids and find out. So if a kid's showing up in your office every day at 12 o'clock with a stomach ache, what are some assessment questions you might be able to ask them? If he's um, getting enough food and bringing a lunch to school, if it's around lunchtime. Good. What else? Someone bullying you. Um, so yes, but you don't, you, you, yeah, exactly. You would absolutely ask about bullying. The thing with kids is you have to be really careful because if they're little, they may not know what bullying is. So what's another way you can ask that? Teasing you, being mean to you. Excellent. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, what else could you ask them at that if they come the same time for the same complaint? They have the same class at the same time every day. Maybe Excellent. it's uh, um, anxiety. Did you bring lunch today? Good, good, Sean. You want to really think about when these kids are coming the same time every day. A lot of times it's because they have math at noon. And math is stressful for them and they're scared about it. It could be that somebody's bullying them too. A lot of times you'll see kids come at recess and they'll have minor complaints at recess, very minor, but they try to get out of recess every day because they're nervous about the social environment. So think about all these things. In the high school, you're going to see the same thing with kids. You're going to see them come to you at math class because, you know, they're worried about um, the tests that they have. So you want to make sure you're assessing them. Are you, do you have a test right now? Something going on? What's going on at home? A lot of times with the little people in schools, 
you'll get a lot of information. They'll just say, oh, well, my dad beat me last night with the belt, things like that. So open that door. You want to be that really good communicator and create a sense of um, safety with these kids. All right. So that's how we look at that. When we're looking at prevention in schools, an example of primary, now see, here's that word that we like for primary. You see it? Educate okay. parents about healthy choices, okay? And risks associated with obesity. If we have secondary, what's the key word we're looking for for secondary? Screening. Very good, and it's right there. We're gonna screen teens for obesity with BMIs greater than or equal to 30. In the state of Colorado, we don't do that anymore, but for purpose of this book, which I think was written in, a couple of years ago. So we're still gonna look for screening for obesity. And we're gonna look at children's height and weight as they as part of their health assessment. So we're screening their height and weight. And then tertiary here, we're gonna be looking for what kind of words? Treatment, treat. Treat, what else did I tell you are two key words for tertiary? Support group and rehab. Very good, mm -hmm. excellent. So here, they, we're not using those words exactly, but think what we're doing. We're working with schools to improve the quality of food. Why would we do this? What are we treating when we're improving the quality of food? Obesity. Very good. We're treating obesity here. And then um, helping communities establish local farm to school networks. And here we're going to have that same thing. So we're able to provide the fruits and the vegetables to the obese community among children. I children's. have a question. Uh-huh. Um, are there still vending machines in the school? Because in chapter 20, it said that um, they've tried to get rid of that in the school. It's not encouraged, but um, I remember going to a school and they said they don't have vending machines because um, it's prohibited. So is that? Well, so it's really district by district as far as vending machines are concerned. I can tell you in our district, so they don't have vending machines, but in the cafeteria, they sell Doritos, they sell Cheetos, they sell uh, splash or slush, some like sugar-based soda. What ends up happening with that is vending machines, they were saying that kids were buying more and more, but you can't restrict children from buying food in a school. So what they've done in some schools, like our district has taken the vending machines out, but then they let the kids buy snacks. So it's kind of the same thing, right? Um, and you have to be really careful because sometimes um, in the state of, actually all over the United States, because of COVID, they did free breakfast and lunch for all students. And so kids were eating two breakfasts and had a lunch and they got a free lunch at school. So, you know, you just have to be really careful. Obesity is a big problem among kids. So those kind of things we want to prevent. Um, so in a school, I've gone to my my cafeteria several times because they'll serve sugary cereals that I think are not really healthy for kids and things like that. But it's really hard because remember schools are funded by the government. And so whatever the government approves as food, you know, oftentimes it's going to be the cheaper of your choices, right? Because they're serving lots of communities. All right. I will tell you, you want to know healthy people 2020 in schools as well. I talked to my class about uh, reducing the number of school days missed with asthma. Um, we're going to look at our vaccination coverage. <clears throat> so we're going to be looking to have the kids in kindergarten and vaccine coverage for adolescents. Mm, that's really what I would focus on. Do you have a question? Somebody's thumb up. Was up? No. All right, so remember Healthy People 2020, we're going to remember vaccinations, we're going to remember protective gear and those kids with asthma. Any questions? Okay. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about family crisis. We talked about healthy versus um, unhealthy. We're going to look at family crisis here. No, a family crisis is going to occur when the family is not able to cope with an event. So when they're not able to function. Zena, you have your thumb, I think it's Zena, you have your thumb up, are you okay? I should just put it down, okay. Um, so that's when a family crisis is going to occur. What's an example of a family crisis? When a family becomes disorganized or dysfunctional? The death of the family, the divorce, lost job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, death in a family is a good one. 
Uh, loss of a job could be if they can't, if they're not able to function, if it's the only, um, uh, you know, the only one providing money to the home. What else? Divorce. Death. Illness. Yeah, yeah all of those. Mm-hmm. If they can't function, that's when it becomes that they can't function. So all of these things, a family may be able to process, right? One family may be able to process divorce different than another one. But if the family becomes like, disor- like dysfunctional and they can't move, move ahead, then that's when we call it a family crisis. When we're looking at family and how, they, how everyone relates to one another, we look at their genetic makeup. And um, we talked about two different things here, but genomes is when we're looking at the genetic makeup of a person. So remember, it has the word gene sort of right in there without the E. And um, it's going to be our most effective way for people to get treatment, as we know, because we know what their genes are. Does that make sense? It goes along with our genome map and our eco map that we talked about. Um, genomes are the thing that are guiding your genome maps. So here's an example of a genogram that I used in my class. So it's really based on what uh, genes does each member of the family have and when they come together, what risk factors are we going to see? You're not going to see an example, I will tell you on the test, of a picture like this and say, what is this? But you may say a a physician or a nurse is um, trying to figure out the genetic connections um, among the patient. Which of the following is something you could use to see this? So the choices might be, what What are some choices that you might see on something? Because remember, it's a nursing exam, so they're going to try to make questions, you know, make some answers similar. So what would a nurse use to- Like a patient um, comes into the clinic and they're concerned about their possibly having breast cancer and they go back and look at the mom and the sister and the grandma and see if they have that BRCA1 gene. Okay, so, and then the question might be, how might what? the nurse assess this? Or how might the nurse record this? With a genogram? That's the answer. Good. What are some other choices that might be on there that they're trying to? Uh, eco map. Very good. They're good. You, we want you to know the difference. Okay, I say they. We all write the test together, so I'm a part of the they. But um, so we we want you to know the difference between those two. Okay. Any questions on that one? All right. So here we look at eco maps. So I'm telling you, you need to know the difference. Eco maps. We're gonna see um, how do their family connections, their social, their environment. That's how I remember this. Is an eco map is gonna be environment. So it's gonna represent how the family interacts with all the different groups. Okay. So it's not gonna be genetically driven. It's gonna be because when we look at an eco map. What are some things that we may see with a family that belongs to a specific um, workplace? What might we see among people in a workplace that is going to come back and impact how the family functions? Think about nurses. Go ahead. Stress. I was just going to say time or stress, and then their stress, and they bring that home to their family, maybe. Okay, and so what's going to happen at that at that place where they work? Do you think they're the only ones that are having that kind of stress? No, ma'am, it's everyone. <laughs> right. So everybody in that workplace, right, is under stress. So that stress is going to go home to everybody's family. And so what is that going to do to the family dynamics in that works? I want you to think about as a nurse um, working with nurses, right? What are some things that nurses, and I hate to use this generalization, but it's sort of kind of true. What are some things that we think of as nurses that almost everybody that you work with agrees upon? Hand hygiene. Excellent. So what do you think nurses, families are going to feel about hand hygiene? That it's important, right? You can have hand sanitizer everywhere. 
Or they say, my mother's a nurse, she's crazy. She makes me wash my hands all the time. That goes on a lot in mm -hmm. nurses' houses, <laughs> right? So think about all those, all, all the kids of, um, <clears throat> of the nurses that you work with, right? And they all probably say the same thing. Or if you go to a college where it's um, religious-based, right? And they say that they don't believe in abortion because, um, because that's the believing. So what is that going to do to the family dynamics if somebody comes home and says that, you know, they've had an abortion, but they come from a, a college where that's not accepted. Will they hide it? Those kind of things. All right. So that's why our eco maps are important. And we move along to home visits. This was towards the end of our, our work uh, in chapter 20, I believe. And so understand why our home, why, why is it best to go to the house? You can t examine um, and assess the safety of their environment. Good. What else are you going to see in a house? How they live, how clean it is. Uh, Nutrition mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. Good. What else? More of the family. Right. You're going to see that family dynamic and what goes on mm -hmm. and who lives there, who takes care. You might see... Um, you know, other people than what, you know, maybe their family is an aunt and a cousin and then the cousin's boyfriend. And, you know, so you get to understand who is the family. What are some disadvantages though? Safety. Good, from the patient's perspective, what do you think is true about people in their home? Maybe they don't feel safe having someone come in their home. So our goal as the nurse is gonna to be to make sure that we create that really good open communication with them. Make sure they're interacting with us, right? They're telling us things. Um, giving too much information in the beginning is not a good idea. You wanna take that time, you wanna build the trust. You don't wanna to get to the dirty and grime right off front, right? Right up front. So some of this is kind of like common sense and I feel like you guys know it, but I'm reviewing it with you because um, you'll see a question or two about this. All right, so when we look at our safety member, we're gonna leave a schedule at your office, plan the visit during the safe times of the day. You're not gonna go when it's pitch dark. We're gonna wear appropriate clothing. We're not gonna be wearing our biggest, latest, you know, diamonds and jewels. We're gonna avoid secluded places. We can take an escort, but what, what do we worry about with escorts? HIPAA? Yeah, HIPAA. Their okay. safety? Yeah. Well, you know, you don't want to take somebody, they say a coworker or neighbor volunteer. But I'd be careful who you bring, but the coworker is probably your best bet. All right, you're going to sit between the client and the exit. You're going to, um, if you don't feel safe, you're going to leave and you're checking with your agency at the end of the day. Any questions on that? I want you to know all of these, but these are kind of common sense-ish. Make sure you're checking in at the agency at the end of the day, okay? You're gonna leave a schedule, but you don't necessarily need to call them in the beginning. You're gonna do it at the end. All right, so we have different phases and activities. Um, our pre-visit is when we initiate contact. So I will tell you, I want you to know the phases. So our pre-visit is when we're gonna initiate contact, see if they're ready for us, schedule a visit and get a referral. Then we're in home, we're gonna say, hi, this is who I am. We're gonna be very professional. We're interact socially. We're gonna establish a relationship. And then we're gonna terminate. We're gonna review the visit with the family and we're gonna plan for future visits. Okay, after the visit is over, not the termination, but just after the visit, it's a post visit, where we're gonna re record and plan for the next one. Okay, so those are phases I just want you to be familiar with. Any questions on those? So pre is before, in is when you're there. Termination is you're gonna be at the end of that visit. And then post visit, you're gonna go and chart, okay? We look at our vulnerable populations. I will tell you right now, I put it in bold. I want you to know who they are. The homeless, mental ill, substance users, veterans, and migrant workers. 
Okay. What kind of question do you think might come out of this? Less all. Mm -hmm. Vulnerable populations include A, B, C, D, E, that kind of thing. All right, so I want you to know them all. Know that they have, when they're vulnerable, they're gonna be more likely to have um, your poverty and that's gonna be the problem there. We're gonna have stress like unemployment, poor education. We're gonna have a higher risk of disease process because of that. Um, we talked about our homeless population in my class. What are, what are some things they do that because they're living in poverty that is gonna possibly give them a chronic illness? What do homeless people do? Like drugs? Sure, and there you'll see a lot of overlap with the vulnerable populations. If they're doing drugs, what does that put them at risk for? Infection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diseases. Yeah. Hepatitis B, HIV, all of those. What other things are you going to see with the homeless? Malnutrition. Absolutely. They get what they can get and they eat what they can have, right? So they're not going to be eating, you know, a real well-balanced diet. So you'll see some um, vitamin deficiencies and things like that. You have to be really sensitive to when we're approaching these populations, you know, because remember when they're mentally ill, the way we approach them may be different than we approach somebody that is not suffering. So I gave you pictures here. Here's our migrant workers. Here's our veterans and here's our homeless. Now look at this homeless picture here. I mean, they have bags, they have like food laying out. I mean, they could get what kind of things do you think they might get from just from the kinds of food they eat? Foodborne illnesses. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because they're not worried about refrigeration. They're not worrying about heating and cooking, right? Okay, so here we come back to our primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so for primary prevention, we're going to give vaccines to the vulnerable population. Secondary, we're going to screen. So we're going to have uh, clinics and we need to screen for things like TB, right? And we're going to screen homeless adults who um, test positive for TB. And then our tertiary, we're going to conduct a ther therapy group with residents for severely mentally ill. We good on this primary, secondary, and tertiary? All right, these are two different acts that I want you to know the definitions of. Family, Family Medical Leave Act and the American Disabilities Act. American Disabilities Act, it tells you exactly what it is. It helps with discrimination of those with disabilities. And then our uh, Family and Medical Leave Act, it allows us to take leave if we have um, a family member or we uh, are sick, um, care providers can be paid, um, can provide unpaid. So FEMLA's not paid, but um, know that this is also gonna cause some trouble sometimes. What it does is it allows you to keep your job and pot potentially health benefits, um, but it will not pay you. So think about people who are using Family Medical Leave Act. Some things they might encounter are um, financial disability, you know, financial struggles um, and balance with caring for work and family. So these two just know definitionally. Any questions on that? This is really uh, acts related to families. Alrighty, we look at advocacy and social injustice and our differences. So um, when we're advocating for something, we're taking action to help others. We function with our vulnerable population to look for policies that are gonna to lead to increase in public health. Social justice is justice where we're helping to um, increase the treatment of more advantaged versus less advantaged socioeconomics. So we try to, social justice means uh, getting them equal. Advocacy means helping those that are not able to help themselves. Any questions on that one? I didn't cover much of this in my class. I don't know if you guys did. 
just know the difference on those two. All right. And that is the end of my PowerPoint. What kind of questions do you guys have? What do you want me to clarify? What that I didn't on your study guide? Nothing. Everybody's silent. So I'm guessing everybody's. I, I have a question. Um, yeah. I was doing uh, like practice questions on Evolve and one of them was, I'm trying to find it real quick, but it said, it was like a select all that apply and um, mm -hmm. said men commit suicide more than women or something like that. And it was wrong, but I found in the book, it was saying that it's 3.5% more likely that they are successful. I don't, I don't know if that's going to okay, be. Okay. So yeah, I know matters. what that topic is. So it, it, it does have to do with, and that um, I don't think is on your exam. I think this, we will cover this a little later on in the semester. But so what it is, is that they find there's certain things like with women, they worry about um, their weight. And then they find with men, they put a lot of pressure on themselves if they are the primary economic provider. But you're not gonna have that question on your test. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Let me just take a look. Just give me one second. I'll be right back because I want to take a look at the exam myself and um, I just don't have it right next to me. And I just want to make sure we covered everything. So hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. I just wanna make sure we covered everything so I feel like you guys are prepared. So if I asked you a question about infants, what are we looking at? SIDS. Yep. So what's gonna put an infant at risk for SIDS? Um, putting them um, prone, um, laying them lateral, putting them on the soft mattress or soft um, surface, um, heating, heat, um, what kind of activities are going to make SIDS more likely? Second From the hand mother. Smoke. Good. Second Secondhand smoking. Smoke. And what else? Late. Um, not more. getting maternal care. Yeah, um, prenatal just, care. Yeah, Good. prenatal care. Good. All right. Um, let's see. What are we going to worry about with our adolescents? Uh, seatbelt safety. Um, Motorbike accidents. Yep. And NBA, what else? There's something yes. that starts with a V. Violence. 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 Mm -hmm. too, maybe. <laughs> We're gonna worry. We're gonna worry about our violence. Good. And seatbelts. Um, what are we gonna look at with gun gun safety? Storage. Storage. Storage, good. What are we going to make sure? It's locked up and that they have that is safely put away. Good. We're going to make sure it's, is it loaded or unloaded? Unloaded. 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 Good. Uh, let's see. What is true about public health nursing? What do we know about public health nursing? Is it something where you have to go to a hospital and you're gonna perform it and somebody's gonna be there watching everything you do? It's autonomous in the community. Good, it's autonomous. You're gonna have that independence as a public health nurse that you may not have elsewhere. 
Okay. Um, what are we going to encourage school age kids' parents to do with their children? Vaccine? Vaccinate? Yeah, medically, we're going to vaccinate, but how about emotionally? Support. Uh huh. Be involved. Support. Yep, being involved. Good. We're going to make sure that they are giving their child as much um, help as they can and not being embarrassed by kids. Because, you know, if, if a parent suggests that they're embarrassed by some behavior, that may um, be something that we need to follow up on. Um, what do we know about chronic health illness among children? Asthma. Obesity is the most prevalent. All right, I think chronic illness here on kids. They require a lot of appointments. So we need so, to make sure that the family is able to support them and take them to their visits. Mm -hmm. Good. We want to make sure we schedule those appointments. Yeah, or help them schedule. Yeah, you want to give them self, you want to give them as much self, you know, ability to do it themselves, but we want to help them because if they have any trouble, then we can help them, right? Good. Um, what do you know about? Uh, what, when we're looking at our vulnerable population, what is our biggest issue there that has um, an impact? Poverty. Uh, very good. Poverty. Family Medical Leave Act, what does that tell us? That tells us that it that secures their job for them being off for certain things, but it does not help them financially. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Good. What are we going to do with our older population? What are we going to worry about if we hear? Abuse. What kind of abuse are we Financial looking? management. Financial. Financial. Mm -hmm. So if we see an adult and you know, an older adult in the home and they say something about someone taking over their money. We're going to follow up on that, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, for our older clients, what are we trying to make sure we do for them? Keep them high at their highest functioning and um, make sure they stay healthy. Good. As healthy as they can. What else? ADLs. Yeah. yeah, we're going to make sure that we give up, you know, promote like they can do it as much as they can. Right. Because we don't want to take things from them. Um, let's see. Secondary prevention for diabetes. Training. Checking their A1C. A1C. Yeah. Experience. Cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So think about, we may not even do a hemoglobin A1C, we may do a fasting when they come into the doctor's office, right? We're screening, because remember, we don't know if they're diabetic yet, but we're gonna do some blood work and see, right? Good. Okay, on our Healthy People 2020 and school-aged kids, something that I've emphasized three times I want you to know about is what? And what's in? No, nope, no, not vaccines. <laughs> Reducing days missed for asthma. Very good. So that's one of our priorities with our school nursing. What was that? I missed that. It's increasing, it decreasing the number of days missed due to asthma. No. Okay. No? Somebody said no. That's just a goal of theirs. Yeah, it's a goal of Healthy People 2020. Uh, okay. What are some things we're going to teach parents of asthmatic children? How to properly use the inhaler or maybe about yep. secondhand smoke. Uh -huh. What else? Make sure they have a rescue inhaler with them at all times. Mm -hmm. What's this primary prevention we're going to do with them? Educate. educate. Yeah, we're going to educate. Good. That's a key word. But what are we going to make sure that they're getting? Their medication. Yep. Before their medication, though, because medication would be treatment, right? 
What are we going to do to help them stay healthy and decrease on our primary yeah. level with vaccination? Don't smoke. Oh. Yeah. Ensure oh. safe environments. Yeah, but having the parents quit smoking. Good. What vaccine are we going to make sure those asthmatics get? Oh, the flu vaccine. Very good. Our flu vaccine. I'm so sorry. What was that? So I said, what is one of primary one of our primary preventions is going to be promoting immunizations, right? And one of those for asthmatics is going to be the flu. Because remember, flu vaccine among asthmatics, just like COVID among asthma, asthmatics, is worse for their breathing, right? Because they're already compromised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about a genome and versus an eco map, right? We know the two of those. Where are you going to see those vulnerable populations? What kind of places would we be able to see them as a nurse? Like public health centers. Excellent. Our health clinics, right? That's where we're going to see them. All right. What do we know about families? Are they all the same or are they all different? They're all different. They're all different. Good. We're going to look at our functional and dysfunctional. Um, and I want you to focus on functional versus dysfunctional, healthy versus unhealthy. So we just want them together. Okay. That's really what we want is we want them together. Um, so if some of them are together, it's better than none of them being together. Our goal is to get them all together. But if you're given some choices, I want you to focus on that some of them are together, okay? That's really our goal with our healthy versus unhealthy. Uh, make sure when we are doing a home visit, we're going to have who with us? Neighborhood volunteer. A worker. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm not sure I would have a neighborhood volunteer, but yes, you are right. Neighborhood volunteer or a coworker, right? With us. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Um, all right, when we're doing Healthy People 2020 with parents, this we didn't go over in our review. New parents, what are we gonna be teaching them? This, prevention. Kids. Yeah, what else? Nutrition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be a little more general. What kind of things are new parents going to need to know? Breast safety. Yeah, car seat. Yeah. Safety. Positivity, right? Showing positivity. Sorry, my dogs have decided to start barking. Hold on a minute. Like, uh, Sorry, resources. I have two little dogs that think they're ready to take on the world. They're both eight pounds a piece, but they sound quite aggressive. Um, all right. Sorry about that, guys. All right. Our vulnerable population, who is included in that? Homeless, veterans, mentally ill, migrant workers. Mm -hmm. And one disabled. more. Disabled. No, oh. not disabled. Poverty. Adolescent, oh. pregnant. No, that's not going to be one of our choices. Veterans. Veterans, and we're missing one group. Mm -hmm. Mentally we got, ill? We got mentally ill. Those substance users. Oh, remember? Oh, yeah. Yep. Your addiction. Okay. Um, what else? Let's see. You guys seem to have all this. You guys are doing really well. Um, mm -hmm. um, I have a question. I Go feel ahead. like I missed when we were talking about new parents. Uh -huh. um, what was the focus for new parents? Just like positive parenting, those kind of things, like how to parent, you know, that people give birth to a child and, you know, that the act is easy. Well, not necessarily, but, you know, the, the nine months, you know, they, they don't know what they're ready for. Right. And then they have a baby and then they're like, now what? Right. And I worked yeah. in the NICU. There's a lot of parents that they, they look at you like, what do I even do with this? So you just want to really okay. promote positive parenting. These are the kind of things you want to do, those kind of things. Okay, thank you.
Sure. Um, <laughs> All right, so some things when we're working with the vulnerable population, we wanna make sure we're doing. We're gonna make sure that we set goals that are reasonable, right? Because they're compromised in some way. We're going to make sure that we're sensitive to them. We talked about you have to really be sensitive because mentally ill, homeless, well, they don't want to be there. You know, a lot of times, I don't know that if you ask the homeless person, do you want to be homeless? They'd say, yeah, but they are. Substance abusers, you know, they may not feel comfortable where they're at. We want to also help them do like self-care strategies, whatever they can do to help themselves, you know, to get to where they need to be. So there's lots of things that we want to do for um, our vulnerable populations. Um, what else? Any questions on vulnerable? Because there's several questions on it. No. We're going to really focus, think about poverty when we're looking at why are people compromised. That's a big one. OK. Uh, Population-focused practice, we're going to make sure we are looking at um, the difference between our population focused. Mm, let's see. And then we have our five math problems at the bottom. All right, there's one thing that I did not cover in my review that I wanna cover right now, and that's frontier nursing service. Did anyone talk about this? I know uh, Professor Price covers this. Any of your classes cover this? Yes, Dr. did. I don't think I've heard of it. Okay, tell us what you learned in your class, Alex. Mary, uh, I can't remember her last name, but she was the one who, they jumped on horses and went out uh, to the Appalachian Trail, I think, mm -hmm. around Kentucky, and they started, um, they were the first ones to do midwifery. Okay, good. What else and do we know about the, good. Our friend, was a vaccines. What'd you say? I think that was Mia, what did you say? Um, they stress vaccination. Very good. So I don't see my one student dropped out. Um, yeah, so we're going to focus on Frontier Nursing Service and the vaccines that they did. Right. They introduced the first midwives, like Alex told us. And uh, public hygiene was a focus, but not with the Frontier Nursing Service, but that was a focus early on. But our Frontier Nursing Service was really big on the immunizations and the midwifery. Good. Um, I have a question. Sure. I feel like I don't know very much about Lillian Wald, but what I need to know about her. Mm, that's one of those nice to know, good to know. If you get my drift. Yes, thank you. Okay. I will tell, I'm just double checking, but um, I'm sure you don't need to know anything specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one other thing I wanted you to know is who gives us guidelines for global health? World Health Organization. Very good. Not CDC, right? That's Center for Disease Control. We're looking at public health. We're looking at World Health Organization. All right, any questions? What? Can you say those two again? Sure. We, the, when we're looking at public health, we're looking at the World Health Organization for our guidance. Good. Any questions at all? Did I take long? <laughs> yes, I have one question. Right. Okay, can you, go ahead. Can you print your PowerPoint? It's excellent. Okay. No, I appreciate that. And I wish I could, but I'll tell you why I cannot. So we are allowed to only share PowerPoints that um, we don't do as exam reviews. So what I would tell you is this is I can't send it out, um, we're not allowed. But what I would do is you can mute me so you don't have to listen to my voice again, but just look at the PowerPoints that way. Okay. On the recording. Unfortunately, I know that would be lovely, but we're not allowed to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, cause I've told my class to, um, I'm sorry, I'm just highlighting the chat so I get everybody in here. So I told my class as well that when you can, we you're only authorized to reproduce or 
give out to um, students from the book, the ones from the book, because we have authorization to do that. But anyway, if there's any questions, I will put my email in the chat and you guys can certainly email me. I'm happy to help you. Um, but if I, if you guys have no further questions, I think you'll do fine. What I want you to do is go into this with confidence. Um, know that you know this stuff. You oftentimes in nursing exams, we know this, um, you get nervous or there's two like close answers. If you don't see select all that apply, you're going to use your ABCs. You're going to be using your ad hoc. You're going to use your ad pie. Those guide those in your answers. Okay. But you guys, we went over almost, we went over all of the study guide and I emphasized to you guys what I want you to really focus on. And so know that it's, um, you know, 50 questions, 10 points will come right off of the math. So that'll help. And if um, anybody needs anything, you let me know or reach out to your professors. And I hope this was helpful. Very much, thank you. I listened to a bunch of views and this has been the most helpful so far, yeah. so. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, Thanks, Alex, thank for you. your help. I have uh, a quick you. question. Sure. For the math, is it just gonna be like oh dosage God. calculations or how do you guys do your math? Uh, so it'll be like IV calculations. It'll oh. be like weight calculations. It'll be, um, yeah, like not dosage, but um, if it's, you know, 10 miles an hour and it has to be given over three hours, like not that easy, obviously, but like along those lines. Okay, thanks. I just wasn't I sure if it was like something it's else helped. or not, so. Yeah, okay. All right, guys, I hope this helped. Best of luck to you. I know you'll do fine. Take care, and um, I will send my reporting to your professors. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome.